Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Okay. My name is Paul Chow. Uh, I'm coming from National Jiaozong University, Department of Double E. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure here today to talk to you about the research I have done uh, maybe in the past five years. And before I talking about the technology, I would like to express my sincere thanks okay, to the people, especially Professor Tsai, uh, who invited me over here to this uh, wonderful, beautiful university. I think the National Sun Yat-sen University it's uh, probably the only one university in Taiwan that uh, when you study every day in a campus, you can see that there's a beach and you can see the sea. Okay. Uh, most of people will be feel present <laughs> when they see the seashore and at the beach. So I believe all the students over here in the, this campus uh, will enjoy the very good environment, especially will grow a very special culture uh, in the characters, uh, characters of uh, the students, uh, become a very good, uh, good addition in the future to the society. Okay, thank you again for putting together this uh, seminar in such a short period of time. Maybe on behalf uh, a little bit on behalf of the Census Council because I am the distinguished lecturer uh, representing the Census Council sometimes uh, to go around the world to talk to the young students. Okay, So uh, let's talk about the technology. I would like to talk to you today. Uh, this is about sensor using a uh, well-known technology, PBG. The PBG is an optical sensor uh, which actually existing in a lot of the IoT device in the daily lives of all the people, including right now the students, okay, 15 audience right now in this classroom. I believe some of you should have smart watch or smart bracelet, okay, wearing on your body right now. So all those devices are actually equipped with PBG sensor. But PBG sensor is a well-known sensor. Uh, however, the technology I'm going to talk about, it's uh, a little bit different from the technology right now you are wearing, okay, about PPG technology. It's a little bit move forward to the medical application. So our targets over here is trying to use this PPG sensor to be modified in the optical system hardware, firmware, and the software in order to detect the blood pressure and the blood flow. Here's the outline of uh, this talk, about 15 minutes. Uh, the first one, I'm going to introduce to you the basic operation principle of a PB sensor. Essentially, it's uh, optical sensors. Then, using this sensor, uh, we are trying to estimate the blood, uh, blood pressure and the blood flow. Uh, the blood pressure is very important for everyone, especially uh, for the chronic patients uh, with problem of hypertension. Some of them are required, and even for some cases, ask by their medical doctor, they need to monitor the blood pressure continuously for a long period of time because they have hypertension. Okay. So our intention over here is to make the PPG sensor being capable of uh, measuring continuously 
the blood pressure for a user. Okay, that's the first one. The second one is blood flow. Blood flow is uh, designed over here. Even though the hardware is very similar to the first one, but the firmware and the software are revised significantly for a special application, which is actually for the hemodialysis patient. I will talk about that later on. Then uh, the last one is about patch. It's a revolutional hardware form factor for the PV sensor. It's become a flexible patch which you can attach to your body on the critical spot in order to have high quality PV signal. In that way, you will be able to detect a lot of bias signal which will never be detected before by any hardware existing in the world. Okay, so let's talk about the first part, the basic principle of a PBG sensor. As I mentioned that uh, maybe majority of you in this classroom and also the audience around the world, you are wearing already a PBG device. The PV sensor existing in all different kinds of uh, smart watch and smart bracelet are shown over here. Different commercial products. But now, none of them can tell you that can be responsible for measurement of blood pressure. I'm talking about responsible is the blood pressure measurement by this device is actually approved by FDA. The reason they cannot do that, it's a uh, all different kind of reason. Essentially the motion artifacts and also the much shorter wavelengths require to calculate the blood pressure. So our effort in our group, not only me, but also including the effort uh, but several other professors in our department. We have dedicated our effort in the past five years trying to develop okay, a new PPG sensor which can overcome the shortcomings I just mentioned in order to finally we can have the blood pressure, blood flow, or even in the future we still uh, for the glucose, but glucose in the, in the future is still not finished yet. It's just in the beginning, so I will not talk about the glucose. It's very difficult, but we will talk about the first two today, the blood pressure and the blood flow. Okay, here's uh, the first generation device, a handheld PPG sensor device we have developed since four years ago, okay. And this handheld device, uh, it's uh, already in a process of commercialization, okay. In collaboration of uh, Acer company right now, it's in the final phase of uh, collecting data and uh, try to get approval from Taiwan FDA. So essentially this one, by using this device, you can put on the particular location, especially over here showing you, it's a radial artery, or somebody say, uh, this is the location for the wrist artery. Then, uh, you will be able to have the PPG waveform in high quality, okay. Then you can uh, use that, uh, this technology, you can predict calculate the blood pressure based on the PPG waveform measured by this handheld device. Later on, we have developed a patch as shown over here. This is the first generation of a patch. About, it was developed about two and a half years ago. It's first generation. Uh, as, as you can see over here in this picture, uh, there's a flexible 
LED. Uh, actually, implemented by organic material and the process. So this patch can be attached to your skin almost without air gap between this flexible patch and your skin. Okay. To have no air gap between the patch and the skin is the top one requirement to have a quality PPG signal. Let me explain why this is the first requirement. It's going to go back to the basic principle of uh, the PPG. Okay. Uh, for the PPG, it's a non-invasive uh, measurement technology. It's already employed, uh, as I mentioned, uh, maybe almost 80% or 90% of you, you are wearing the PPG device. Okay. As far as uh, the hardware is concerned about the PPG device, the hardware is uh, very simple, uh, essentially consisting two important components. One is uh, LED, okay, let me, okay. One is uh, LED emitting a light, lighting power. Another critical one is a PD photodiode, okay. So using this module, including two critical components, okay, one is emitting the light power, the other one is uh, trying to capture the light power, uh, the light power captured by the PD, it's actually containing some portion of lighting power coming from the LED. And uh, this lighting power, based on the basic optics, will have a refraction, refraction, uh, all different kinds of uh, optical phenomena, and some very small portion of uh, optical power coming out of uh, the LED will finally uh, go through the optical tress over here, finally reach the photodiode. If the trace over here, okay, along the optical power coming out of the LED and finally reach the photodiode, actually going through blood vessels, okay, the absorption of blood vessels coefficients, it's actually different from, as shown over here, three different layers of blood vessels. Because of hemoglobin in the blood, okay, and uh, the absorption coefficient of hemoglobin is very different from all the tissue surrounding and bone fat surrounding the blood vessel. So, whatever the optical power along. Uh, traveling along this, what we call banana shape, is like banana. If this banana is actually cross any blood in a blood vessel with hemoglobin inside, then it's going to be absorbed a lot as compared to those optical power didn't go through cross the blood vessels. So it's going to refract that small portion. I'm sorry. Go back. There's a small portion of optical power received by the photodiode. It's going to show you the information of uh, the size of a blood vessel. 
the size of a blood vessel is going to pulsating in a frequency of heart rate. Okay, the blood vessel wall is not a stiff wall; it's a muscle. Okay, this muscle will help to pulsate the blood vessel over here. Okay, in the size diameter of uh, the blood vessel over here, we are targeting on the wrist artery. Okay, then the absorption portion of absorption received by what happened? Received. Let me. There is something wrong in the. I cannot move. Okay, good. Uh, because because the blood vessel is uh, pulsating in size, so the total amount of absorption by the hemoglobin in the blood vessel is going to also pulsating and uh, embedded in the components receive 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 by the photodiode over here so the photodiode is a very well known device but still developing because uh, the efficiency of a photodiode still a hard issue research issue not only in the company uh, but also in the uh, research institute, including the university. So those very small components of a pulsating optical power received by the photodiode. Okay. The photodiode is going to convert those pulsating optical power to the current oh, signal. So by a good design of uh, arrow from M, uh, you can convert that pulsating current to a pulsating voltage signal. Essentially, I don't know if there any of you is uh, specialized in the arrow circuit design. Uh, essentially, using a TIA trans impedance amplifier. But that pulsating component is small. That's the difficulty of uh, PVT signal in hardware and uh, arrow front end design. So, if you're looking at your oscilloscope to look at output voltage signal from the TIA over here. The entire signal, okay, almost half, 90%, for most of the cases, would be 95% or 98% or DC, okay. And the remaining less than 5%, uh, here we have a 10%, it's very optimistic. It's usually, it's not the case well, if you don't have a exp good experience, okay, it's uh, usually well, less than 5%. And this uh, AC signal representing the pulsating cross-section of the blood vessel, okay. Now, the, the job, the technology will be involved how to single out, filter out, only the AC components. Because the DC component is actually nothing to do with the pulsation of the blood vessels. So it's nothing to do with our uh, cardiovascular system. It's nothing to do with uh, the blood pressure or blood flow. So in the hardware, in the analog and the digital design, circuit design, readout circuits, you need to design a very good top 
performance readout circuits, including analog or digital part. Otherwise, you won't have good enough signal to calculate the blood pressure and the blood flow later on. So that's the technology barrier uh, for the PPG signal. Okay. So talking about the readout circuitry, so here's uh, the overall generic architecture of the readout circuitry. Okay. Uh, the readout circuitry of the PV signal is not all the same by different designer. It's a uh, millions of variation in the analog front end and the digital circuit design for the PV sensor. This is a version we develop. Okay. Uh, there is a LED and a PD. The signal will come out of uh, the PD and using the first stage of analog readout is a transimpedance amplifier. And then amplifier filter, try to filter out the DC component I just mentioned, and then convert it to digital signal, transmit it to the cell phone or to the cloud by cell phone directly to the cloud. So there is a wireless module. Then in the software, we will do the signal processing again. And also, most importantly, there is a decision machine making a decision that whether or not to decide the quality of uh, incoming PPG signal to determine whether or not the quality is good enough for calculating blood pressure at the blood flow. Okay. So inside uh, this handheld device, this is a picture. This is actually the second generation of a handheld device we have developed. Uh, it was ready about two years ago. Okay. So this is a PCB, two-sided PCB. At one side, uh, there is a you know, human machine interface, and there is a, a MCU. On the other side, there is a LED and a PD battery and the wireless module. Okay. Uh, we have designed this handheld device, particularly for blood pressure prediction. In order to do that, uh, there are several sub-module which are different from the PPG device you have in your smart watch and the smart bracelet, which are, uh, we have changeable LED PD for different wavelengths. Okay. Uh, auto gain control to have adaptively tune emission label of LED in different wavelengths to cope with different skin colors of users. Okay. It's all auto. So there is also a company with the auto gain control is the auto LED emission intensity control. It's not done manually because in the future, you hope you can commercialize your handheld device. You cannot, all this tuning cannot be tuned manually. It has, you have to develop an automatic tuning algorithm in the firmware in this handheld device. Okay. The most, one of the most important components is the LED PD module. We started to collaborate with uh, three years ago. It's, it was the uh, number one LED manufacturer in the world to develop this PPG module. So there are four different LED in four 
different wavelengths from visible light, green light, to IR 940. Different wavelengths will give you the capability of a different penetration depths under your skin. For the blood pressure measurement, we would like to have very high quality, especially secondary feature in your PVG waveform. So it's often required based on the basic principle and the theories, we like to have deeper penetration depths by the emission light coming from the PBG waveform. Otherwise, we would not be able to detect the wrist artery. Okay. So based on the basic principle, the property of a PBG module, uh, we need to use the IR lighting. So that's why they have, we have incorporated the Nihil Model 40 other than the popular green light and the red light. Okay. So in order to figure out what's the optimal design and the layout of LED and PD, we have done, uh, we need to do, uh, uh, we have done about two years ago the optical stimulation of uh, this LED PD module on a human skin over here. And there are simulation of a banana shapes by different wavelengths of LED under the skin to see if the penetration depth is really as deep as we desire to detect the wrist artery. All this simulation has been done by some kind of a software and finally we can find out it's must to design the distance, the layout of LED and PD, the distance between the LED and PD to be some distance based on the optical simulation. Because there will be corresponding to the size of a banana shapes for different wavelengths. So based on this optical simulation result, we collaborate with, uh, at the time, number one LED manufacturer in the world that to, to realize the LED and the PD module. If you're looking at the realistic measurements, to be compared with the other available PPG module seen over here. So this is the ample tube, AC ample tube, by our design LED and PD module. The, the first two actually obtained by the other two commercial products. You can see that the ample tube over here it's a little bit larger than the other two. So uh, by this information, uh, actually there's a new company already sell, successful, sell his uh, LED PD module to the cell phone company, okay? And what's the, in order to do that, to have a very good quality PPG web phone, okay? In the analog front end, we need to do some technique of a signal processing. The first one is a filter. This is a very simple uh, second order filter. Now we are using fixed order. The reason we need to use higher order filter because we want to have very clear cut between the pass band and the stop band. Uh, I'm talking about the terminology of a, a filter. And the other thing is uh, there is a, before we are trying to kill uh, in the firmware and uh, in the software, before we are trying to calculate the blood pressure, okay, we need to determine whether or not the quality is good enough. And if there, there is uh, any anomalies which are not allowed, does not give you a complete waveform 
of a PVG, you need to make a decision. You, you either tell the user that, could you do the measurement again? Or you're going to correct that using enough time period of the PV signal to conduct the blood pressure measurement. So there are several uh, pre-quality checking before really calculating the blood pressure you need to be done. Okay, so here's a, we need to make sure the dynamic range is large enough. There is a no outliner. And looking at the frequency spectrum, the main peak should be corresponding to some kind of a value in the reasonable range of a human heart rate. Okay. So once you have done that, we can have the good quality of a PVC signal. Then you can go ahead to be to develop a blood pressure algorithm. Then calibrate your algorithm based on the ground truth data obtained from a cuff type blood pressure monitor. Okay. Then finally show your result. SBP, DBP, uh, essentially blood pressure. Uh, in a laptop uh, user interface, or you can show it uh, in a cell phone application app, app, app. And all those measurement data okay, uh, will be transmitted to the cloud system to build personal database for each users. So the each user will be able to check their PVG waveform for a long time, several years back, especially for the chronic patients. It's very important to have a long time database. And also, your medical doctor can look at this database to initiate some treatment okay, without really resulted from the in-clinic diagnosis. Okay. So that's about the hardware, firmware of a PVG device. So let's talk about how we develop the algorithm for the blood pressure. We the algorithm is actually, the, the latest version is the AI algorithm, so artificial neural network. Okay. For this kind of uh, a regression model, you need to have a ground truth data to calibrate your neural network model. Here is uh, the data, uh, the, the information about how we're going to collect data. Uh, the data is actually collected from hospital. So actually we consider the 79 males, 17 female, age range from 21 to 48, and the ground truth data for all those people are over here. And especially we need to consider based on the FDA approval requirements with, within all these 96 subjects, there must be some portions of uh, some portion of uh, the subjects in the in so-called have uh, the blood pressure in the hypertension range. So they are hypertension range over here, uh, based on the FDA uh, approval. It's uh, uh, subjects with SBP over 130. Uh, millimeter mercury. Okay, so in this group of 96 subjects, there are 14 regarded by this definition by the FDA or hypertension subjects. Okay, so one of the algorithms we have developed is based on 
pulse wave velocity principle. Okay, essentially based on very simple principle, the traveling time of a pulse wave of the blood inside a blood vessel is actually somehow inversely proportional to the blood pressure. So when we're looking at one single PV signal, they are essentially two different peaks. Okay. The time interval between the two different peaks can be regarded. The second peak is because there is a reflection of the pulse wave traveling to the end of the limbs and reflected back. So based on that kind of effect, okay, the time interval between the first peak and the second peak, it's uh, actually inverse proportional to the speed. Then based on this information and uh, the well-known pulse wave velocity, we can go ahead to calculate the blood pressure. Uh, they are, uh, we have developed the first version of a blood pressure algorithm, which is based on deterministic equation. Uh, in this area, the well-known, everybody knows, the pulse wave velocity equation. But later on, we find out that uh, it uh, may be possible to do it in a different way, using the AI algorithm based on the fact that all the time interval, okay, due to the original signal, first derivative and the second derivative, and considering their zero crossing to segment the one single complete B2B -B cycle to eight different segments, of time intervals, F1 to the F8. So the length in the time axis, the long time axis, of this eight different time interval, it's actually contains the information about your cardiovascular system. We hope that to use this time intervals as the input feature for the artificial neural ne network and uh, calibrate this neural network by the ground truth data. Hopefully we can be able to have satisfactory accuracy of a blood pressure measurement prediction, I should say. Now, okay. So, over here is a list of all the features we consider as the input of an artificial neural network later on uh, we created to predict the, the blood pressure, including, including time interval over here and the amplitude, okay, and the feature in the frequency domain. Essentially, there will be the first peak, second peak, and so on. Considering all these different features before we really to calculate, I should say, calibrate using the ground truth, calibrate the neural network. Let's do the uh, principal component analysis. Try to do different combination of different features and try to find out the relative importance of uh, these different features to the blood pressure prediction. Okay, so we later find five principal components, which will be good enough because it's uh, going to attribute to 88% of importance to the blood pressure. So later on, we consider these five different inputs uh, are not original inputs. They are a certain linear combination of original uh, time intervals of frequency components 
and the amplitudes. So we go on to calibrate our neural network. And then later on, here's the result. Okay. Uh, if we consider the, we have some technical problem. Okay, good. If we only consider the first five uh, principal components, the both of them, the SPP and DPP is going to give you very good result, the gray A. Essentially, if it's uh, this kind of data, you can submit it uh, to the European or British Health Service for FDA approval. Okay, uh, I think we don't have uh, too much time right now. That's uh, for the second part. Uh, I will talk about a little bit faster about blood flow. Okay, using the same device, we can detect the blood flow of uh, uh, ABF or AB shunt of a hemodialysis patient. Commercial device. I'm sorry, there's a. I don't have time to convert it. Convert the Chinese over here to uh, English. Let me explain to you. This is our patch. Uh, it's under development to develop to calculate blood pressure. It's good enough right now. Blood oxygen and uh, AFib. Okay, it's just a patch compared to the other one, smartwatch and a handheld device. This is a uh, very high comfortability for wearing this device as compared to uh, this smart watch and smart bracelet. Maybe somebody will say a uh, uh, smart watch and a smart bracelet is also very comfortable. Okay, but however, there is a serious shortcomings because if you wear the smart watch and smart bracelet loosely, there is a serious motion artifact, actually relative motion artifact between between the smart watch, smart bracelet, and your body. So those negative effects is going to prevent you to get any kind of a PV signal. So if you want to get very good quality of a PVG signal using a smart watch or a smart bracelet, you probably need to tighten up very tight, almost feel very uncomfortable. But our patch, okay, by nature, eliminate motion artifact a lot. Okay. So that's one of the original motivation we want to develop this. And thanks to great capability offered by Taiwanese company, Taiwan's company have a lot of them have a very special capability in a semiconductor material processing. So that's the reason we have a resource in Taiwan to manufacture this kind of flexible PBG patch. I would imagine it would be very difficult to develop this kind of a device in most of the country in, the, in this world. Okay. So, by the handheld device and the patch, okay, we'll be able to develop the new type of a PV sensor, okay, offering a lot of functionality which cannot be offered right now by the commercial PV device, PVG device in the smart watch and smart bracelet. Right now, the performance for predicting SPP and the DPP is up to the two millimeter mercury and the 1.87 millimeter mercury. But however, this accuracy is somehow uh, done by a small group of subjects in a particular given hospital site. In order in the future, if you want to commercialize it, to pay, I'm sorry, to pass the FDA approval, you need to do multi-site calibration and the testing, which we are doing right now. So uh, that's for the blood pressure sensor. For the blood flow, okay. Now we have also very good accuracy within 130 uh, 
uh, in the broad form. Uh, and this is close, 130 is close to 100 by the ground truth HD03. So it's close enough. It's already there. Uh, the commercial prototyping is already there. We are collecting the final round of the data in the Xinguang Hospital right now in Taipei to finally, hopefully, we can put on this kind of a product in the market to help, uh, unfortunately, a large group of hemodialysis patients in Taiwan. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's thank Professor Zhao once again for his inspiring speech. Thank you for attending. The next session will begin at 4 right here in this room.